Hi, I'm Amber, and welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today, I have a really special guest, a fellow Texan, Mary Roberts, and she is a ketogenic lifestyle coach and also a food addiction and recovery coach. Very important stuff here. So we're going to be discussing all kinds of things dealing with that. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. I just love Mary. I follow her and, you know, we were just talking about how we're kind of, we're kind of our people here. You know, (laughs) we've been through a lot of very similar things. I think uh, actually Mary has been through a lot more extensive things than I have, but just real quick for the audience who may not know who you are, give a little bit of your background. You don't have to go into detail because we'll get into a little bit more of the things we discussed earlier. So just kind of uh, how you've come along and where you're at now and why you do what you do. Okay. So I'm currently 49 years old and I have had a disordered relationship with food since like I was a preteen. Um, went on my first diet when I was 14 and like that was the first of many. Like, so from age 14 till um, six and a half years ago, like I did it all um, and tried everything and was like, you know, on the diet roller coaster and definitely had Um, eating disorder issues from bulimia to binge eating. Um, And then so six and a half years ago, I found keto through a friend. And it's like, it's literally changed my life. Awesome. And uh, why do you feel the need to help others? Like, where does that passion come from? Because I suffered for so long. And I tried everything and always my entire life, I thought that I wasn't succeeding because I was lazy, because I was undisciplined, because I didn't want it bad enough or, you know, because I I tried to follow all the rules. Like I would do diets and I would like succeed in the short term, but ultimately like I would, I would fall off because what I didn't realize was that I had a food addiction, primarily carb addiction, but I have a beef about, about that. I, I don't, I don't like when it's like referred to like as just carb addiction because I myself and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of other people are capable of overeating and binging on foods that are not carbohydrates, like, cause it's an emotional disordered relationship with food. So, um, I just, I, I suffered for so long. And when I discovered that everything I had been told was basically a lie. Like when I did the opposite of what all the experts say to do, I finally felt better, looked better, got off medications, healed my illnesses. And it was no thanks to the expert advice. And so that just like stirred something in me. I was like, now I got to tell, you know, I'm going to share my story because I want people to know they don't have to continue to suffer. They don't have to continue to like feel like they're crazy because they are following the rules. And then, you know, there's doctors not believing that they're following the rules because they're not getting results. Right. So we all must be lying. Um, And so I just, I share because I want people to know that there is an answer. They don't have to continue to suffer needlessly, that there is something that they can do about it. And it doesn't require medication and just accepting that, Oh, I'm getting old. This is the way it goes. Like we get on meds and then we die. Like it doesn't have to be that way. I love that. I love that. Love it. Love it. Perfect. (laughs) Okay. So with the history you have with eating disorders and such, there's always some kind of trigger. You are not born having a body self image issue or emotional issues or whatever it is that caused you to feel the need to do this to your body. Mm -hmm. Do you no? Have you figured it out? Do you know where it originated? Do you know why you have those feelings? Do you know why you abused food in that way or, you know, through eating disorders? So there's lots of variables, but the two main things were, so I grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was an alcoholic and he didn't get sober until I was a teenager. Um, So there was lots of things like happening in the home that were like, you know, emotionally upsetting. And I discovered that, you know, food was a, you know, a soother, right? Like, so I would, you know, food became my friend. Um, But as, and then as far as like body image, like early on, like I, um, I started developing boobs in the third grade. And so, and you know, I know you can relate. We were talking about this. I have big boobs 
And when you have big boobs, it makes you feel big everywhere. And so, you know, from a fairly, you know, preteen age, and, and then as I, you know, through my teenage years, they just kept getting, I think when I was a senior in high school, I was a D cup in, as, as, a, as a high schooler. And so, you know, that always made me feel larger than I, than I was. And when I look back, I mean, we've all said this, right? I struggled with feeling fat and I was sure that I was fat. And, it, and at some point I did get a little bit, you know, chubby um, in high school because um, I started binging and then I became bulimic. And, um, you know, so there was a point where I did have a little bit of a weight problem, but even looking, looking, you know, when I look back to when I really thought I was fat, I was not fat. I just had big boobs. Um, and it like, <laughs> that just like set the tone for the rest of, you know, the rest of my life. So I think those two things like turn, you know, having turmoil in my home um, and using food as a way to soothe my emotions and things I was feeling. And then that, that body image issue, you know, definitely played a, a big role. Yeah. The boobs part. Let's talk a little bit about that because I think people just really don't understand that it can really be traumatizing to a girl who is young when she's different. That's the thing. You're different. So you were in the third grade. Good God. Yeah, I, my I was in the fifth. I was in the fifth grade and I know how that affected me. Yeah. How did the girls treat you? Um, I don't, you know, it's funny. Like, I don't remember, like, remember too much about that. I do know my friend was like, you're lucky, you know, cause she would stuff her bra. <laughs> like, she'd be like, you're lucky. But it really more so like, um, I got teased by the boys. Oh. Um, and so that like, you know, really, you know, caused some like self-esteem issues. And, um, but yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't really get mistreated by, by the girls, but also like, it, people always thought I was older than I was too. And I think it's because, because of that. So there were definitely like creepy times where like, you know, older people, you know, like older people would say stuff to me because they didn't realize I was so young. Um, and so that all like has an effect on our psyche. <laughs> Oh, it most definitely does. And speaking of that, I'm going to go ahead and get into this a little bit before we get into some more specific stuff. You post a lot of pictures of yourself and it's not always before afters, but you're dressing up in these cute little outfits. And I would, you know, I, I see them as I'm going through my feed and I'm like, yeah, you go girl smoking. And I always put those little fire symbol yeah. symbols because I'm like, Ooh, she hot, you know, psh. why do you post those pictures? Is there a, a reason, maybe even something you haven't really thought about why you do that? I do it because, so when I, all the years that I spent being obese, um, so I've always been like what I would call like a girly girl. I like, you know, jewelry and clothes and shoes. I've always liked that from, you know, my, my teenage years. I remember one time my speech and debate teacher, like one day I had this, I had paired like red with turquoise and I had jewelry on it. And my teacher was like, I love how you, you know, mix and match colors and you look fabulous, you know? So it's like, it goes back to like a young age. I've just liked that. But when all the years I spent being obese, I stopped, you know, I got depressed. I stopped, you know, doing those things. I, I stopped trying to dress up. I stopped wearing makeup. I stopped doing my hair. didn't get my nails done. Certainly wasn't wearing <clears throat> high heels. And I kept putting off life. Like I didn't buy cute clothes anymore because I kept saying, when I lose the weight, when I lose the weight, when I lose the weight, then I'm going to get, you know, these clothes. And so, and I had so many experiences in a dressing room, having a meltdown. Like, I think a lot of women have experienced this, like yeah. having meltdowns in a dressing room because something doesn't fit or you're just disgusted with how big you look and things don't, you know, you just don't feel good. Um, so when I lost the weight, I started to return to myself. I'm like, okay, now I can wear the clothes and, and the shoes that I want. Um, and that was a big driver for me. I mean, obviously I wanted to, you know, fix all my health problems because I felt like crap from being unhealthy, but the, the wanting to wear cute stuff was a huge driver for me. Um, so I share and I do because, so 
I started my Instagram account. Like this is why I started my Instagram account. One, because I wanted people to know my story and that they didn't have to suffer, but also I wanted a forum to like show off my shoes. So like, that was why I started, started Instagram. I wanted to post about my clothes because I was excited. I was excited that I could like wear stuff again. Um, so, and, and I know there are other women out there who they did the same thing that I did. They stopped taking care of themselves. They, they, you know, Mm -hmm. have bad experiences in the dressing room and they're, they think that they'll never be able to wear anything cute again. So that's why I, I post and I get a lot of feedback too. Like people are like, I love your shoes. I love when you do this. Where did you get that dress? Where did, you know, so there's like a connection there with, with someone. And then, you know, there's other women who like, they, they don't care about like clothes and shoes and that's fine. But the ones that do connect with me. So um, that's why. Yeah. I love it because it's like, yeah, girl, show it, you know, and I just think you just have this such sexiness about you because it's like a, <laughs> a confidence that radiates and you're like, you, you seem confident, but here's the thing. I want to know when you look in the mirror, what do you see? I know what I see when I look at you, but what do you see? So that's a, that's kind of like, that's a tough question because this is where my struggle remains. Like, I don't like, as far as like my eating disorder, I don't get caught up in like food issues anymore, but I really struggle with, with body image and, and body dysmorphia. So on a good day, I see you're, you know, I see that I'm strong and that I'm curvy on a bad day. I'm like, Oh, I hate my stomach. I want a tummy tuck. Oh, my arms, you know, and I nitpick at, at everything. So it really just depends on the day. I have more good days than bad days now. Um, but it's still, you know, there's like still, it's always there. And then if, and then also like, I'll get like my body image stuff will get triggered by words. People say, even if they mean it as a, as a compliment, somebody the other day messaged me and they're like, I love your big, strong legs, but guess what stood out? Guess what words stood out to me? Big, big, big. big. I'm mm -hmm. like, thanks. I think <laughs> <laughs> I like the strong part. Not so sure. I like the big part. <laughs> So I struggle with the, you know, with that, but I mostly try to focus on look. I know I have more muscle. My goal is not to be skinny. My goal is mm -hmm. to be strong and, and maintain, you know, my curves. I like that. Um, I'm not trying to, to, to be, I'm not trying to be thin necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm definitely not at my thinnest, um, on keto, and when I, and sometimes I get upset about like what the scale says, but when I look back at, at pictures, I'm like, you know, I just look thin there. I don't look muscular. You know, I like mm -hmm. a more muscular fit athletic look, I guess. Yeah, I, I totally can relate with that. I, that's something I still struggle with. You, you know, it depends on the day. Most of the time I'm pretty cool about it. But yeah. again, if I got, you know, some kind of comment that I, I could very easily misinterpret it, even though they meant it good, yeah. but I'll take a word and flip it and make it negative. Yeah. So yeah, I totally, totally understand about that. It's an, I think people don't understand. This is an ongoing process. It this is. is something that you just, poof, bam, I'm cured. I'm good. No. Right. Yeah. I always say like, I don't think we ever arrive. I think there's always something, you know, that we can be pursuing. Um, you know, we're all like striving to be the, the, the best version of ourselves. So like I, you know, I, I work out not because I'm, I'm trying to achieve this like perfect body. Like I know that's, that's not, that's not the goal. That's not what is going to happen. I work out because I like the first and foremost, I like the way it makes me feel, but I do also like the results. And I like when I hit a new PR and I'm stronger than I was two weeks ago, like it all ties in together and, and, and feels good. Um, but yeah, that the body image thing is, is definitely a struggle. I'm, st I, I still don't get excited about, like, I haven't had like a um, experience in a dressing room where I put on a bathing suit and then like, yeah, I haven't had that, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> So, but I'm not crying over it, right? Like I'm not crying in dressing rooms anymore over, over bathing suits, but I, I, you know, I, I, there are things that I still struggle with. 
for sure. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it, it's okay. It's a process. Yeah. It's a process. It's, you know, ev- I mean, don't think you're alone if you're going through that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's get even a little more personal here. Um, because I struggled with this too. I've struggled with a couple of things you've struggled with. Uh, one of them is bulimia. And it seems like right now it's just not fashionable to talk about, you know, the eating disorders really. Um, back uh, when Karen Carpenter, Carpenter came out in the 70s about being bulimic, it was a huge thing. And, you know, everybody was all about, you know, oh, you know, we got to get help to these people and all this. Now you hardly even hear about it, but you know, it's still going on. You know, it is. Yeah. And so I want to talk a little bit about that and how that affected your life and how severe it was and um also go ahead let's get to that and then i'll I'll finish my question so i discovered bulimia when i was in in high school um i thought this is a way for me to eat all the junk that i want and and possibly not gain weight but i i still you know i mostly maintained but i still you know put on some weight doing that and for me, it got severe enough that um, my parents ended up putting me in a like a women's hospital for um, eating disorders. So I was hospitalized for like six weeks um, in a treatment program for eating disorders. And um, so, but, and I, I haven't, once that, that, once that happened and I came out of the hospital, like for, I, I did never returned to purging, but I still like, you know, had that even carried it into my, my keto journey somewhat, that bulimic mentality, you know, um, which is when you do so like, so when we binge and we, you know, physically purge, you know, the, the that's how, what everybody thinks of bulimia as like that, you, you know, you're vomiting, but it's also when you binge and then you, anything that you do that you're trying to undo what you did. So you're trying to undo the binge by la- taking laxatives or diuretics or excessive exercising or um, like fasting for three to five days to like cleanse yourself of the binge and all that. Like, so all of that is like bulimic mentality. And, you know, but I think we're about, we're about the same. I'm 49. We're, are we around the same 50, age? Like, so, 54. I'm old. Okay. So, so I am of that, that time period where of like the after school specials, you remember those? Like, yeah. Oh yeah. 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 There's tons of them about eating disorders. And yes. It was, yes. It was usually anorexia or bulimia. They yes. never talked about anything else. So I think society in general, when they hear the words eating disorders, they, that's what they picture either anorexia or bulimia, but it, yeah eating disorder is like covers that and so much more. It's like all that disordered behavior with food. You know, if you um, are obsessed with, with body image, if you are obsessed with food and thinking about food all the time, if you plan your life around food, if you do like things like secret eating or hiding wrappers or lying to people about what you eat, you know, going through a drive through and pretending to order for multiple people, even though you're going to eat it all. Like all of that stuff is disordered that encompass that falls under the eating disorder umbrella, binge eating, compulsive eating, like all of that. It's not just bulimia and anorexia. And I think that that's where people don't, you know, and you see all the memes and the jokes online, right? Like we all got jokes about food, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's like a funny thing to like overeat or like people make jokes about eating a whole pizza or a whole gallon of ice cream because I'm depressed or I have my period or whatever. Right. Like there's all it's, it's socially acceptable to eat like crap and to eat excessively. Right. Um, And so that's like what we're, we're fighting. So when it comes to eating disorders that don't fall under the bulimia and anorexia umbrella, it's not taken seriously. Um, and people don't understand. And, you know, the, the, the addiction, food addiction is real. I mean, for sure, carb, carbohydrates, sugar addiction is real, but even people that don't eat sugar and grains anymore still binge. They're binging on meat. They're binging on eggs. They're binging on nuts, like everything keto. approved. There are a lot of people that are keto and carnivore that are still binging because they haven't resolved the, you know, emotional, issues the reasons that they use food so like yeah you can get rid of like the inflammatory foods but until you deal with the reason why you misuse food you'll continue 
to overeat. Uh, that's so true. And I remember I put up uh, some kind of post about um, basically uh, protein is hard to overeat. And I think for the average person, it is. Okay. I did have a binge eating disorder. I was bulimic. I, I had all those things. But for me personally, and I do not know why, I physically cannot overeat protein. So that's that rang very true for me. However, you commented and said, eh, that's not necessarily true. And it kind of opened my eyes because I'm like, oh yeah, that does make sense. Why just because it's a food that fills you up more, if you if that part of your brain is turned off, why can you not overeat that? So touch on that a little bit because probably there's a lot of people like me who really don't fully understand that part because yeah. for them it's like, oh, nope, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. So I know it's kind of like, it's, it's definitely a sensitive subject and there are, so, you know, we, there's like a spectrum of disordered, you know, of disorder when it comes to food. And for some people, simply removing the offensive items are, is, is good, right? Like people mm -hmm. remove it for whatever reason, they don't have too much, you know, turmoil over it. They don't miss the old food. They're, they don't, they don't need to have that like full stuffed feeling to feel comfort or whatever. So there's definitely people like that. But I think the majority of people that struggle with, with food, um, that it doesn't matter what it is. Um, because what we're looking for is like, we're still looking for soothing. We're looking for that full, like that, that physically full feeling, which you don't always feel that I think with, with meat. I love how in, you've probably read it already, Ben Bickman's book, The Why We Get Sick. Uh -huh. There's a little blurb in there talking about like the difference between feeling full and feeling satisfied. Yes. Like that we don't necessarily, like a lot of people associate feeling satisfied with like this fullness in your stomach. Mm -hmm. But what it really, like being satisfied is really that the cells are happy. And even if you don't have that feeling of fullness in your stomach, you feel satisfied because your cells are happy with the food you've given it, right? Well, a lot of people with eating disorders, you know, like the leptin thing stops working, like they're leptin resistant. They cannot tell when they're, when they're really hungry or when they're, when they're satisfied. And so they use that stomach full feeling as their gauge, which is how they end up overeating meat. Um, you know, like you see people that like, and, and I see, you know, people like in the, in the keto and carnivore community online. I mean, you see people that are eating like two, three, four pounds of meat. I personally don't think that that's net, but we don't need that, that much. The average person doesn't need that much. <laughs> Someone who's athletic and like, you know, lives in the gym or whatever could get, a, get away with that. But I think like it, like you can tell that there are some people in the community that are still overeating and they think it's okay because they're only eating meat. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're uh, these, but then, you know, we see, and we see people also drop off. They seem to be doing so well and they're popular and then they disappear and they come back a year later. They're like, Oh, I've gained a hundred pounds back or whatever. You know, we see these kinds of things happen and it happens because it's never, the issue is never addressed up here. It's not as simple as just eat meat, just eat keto because we can very like there's a lot of people that very easily can gravitate towards you know overeating that um but i don't want to discount the fact that there are people who they just you know they just start eating meat only they feel perfectly fine with that they don't ever feel compelled to like go eat again i mean there's examples of that in, in the community also um but the, the so but i like when people qualify like well this is what it's you know this is what how it was for me because otherwise there's people that think, oh, uh, why, you know, why something's wrong with me. Why can't, why, you know, I'm eating only meat. Why do I still want to eat all the time? Why am I still thinking about cupcakes? Why am I, you know, it's because there's that emotional component that hasn't been addressed. And, you know, people think that they're broken because they're comparing themselves to someone who, you know, they're saying, all I did was eat meat and I'm great yes. now. <laughs> yep. And, and what's really funny um, is that in my coaching, it's not really about the food. There's a few questions yeah. here and there about that. It's not about that. It's about this up here. Yeah. And, and they're ha struggling with that. So I end up coaching more on the emotional part, the mental part, than I ever do about the diet itself. Yeah. And, you know, that's a very eye opener, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The food part is easy. Like, and I know, like, a, but a lot of people, and I have people, you know, come to me and they want to talk about the food 
And they want to like, well, what are the macros? What do I, what can I eat? What can I eat? I'm like, yeah. well, you know, that part's pretty simple. And, you know, at first people wouldn't, anything that's new, right? Like we get excited and, and they can like do well for a, a week or two, right? Yep. And then all of a sudden, like, they're like, oh, I had a cheat meal. It's, it is, it is really is very little to do with the food. Like, yes, we have to, there are certain things we should avoid and certain things we should embrace because it's nutrient dense and, and good for us. But that's not the real, the problem isn't really like what to eat. Like that's the easy fix. It is the, that emotional component. Well, what do I do when, you know, I go over to a relative's house and they're pushing the birthday cake on me? You know, what do, what do I do when, you know, I, we go out to eat to my favorite restaurant and, and I always have the dessert and, you know, but now I'm feeling like I can't and I'm feeling restricted and deprived. And like, it's all this, you know, the emotional stuff that people don't know how to deal with. And we, you know, we have that voice of sabotage that is like, oh, it's your birthday. Just have some cake. But how many of us, like, I can't think of any birthday ever in my life that I had one piece of cake ever. It's just, yeah. I'm not a moderator. I, it's like, you know, one, one is too many, 10 is not enough. Like mm -hmm. there is no like moderation for me. So, you know, we've all, we've got that, that voice that keeps trying to tell us that we can be a moderator, but all of our track record history and behavior says mm, you can't. Yeah. I don't get triggered very often, but one of the things that does trigger me is when they say, you can have anything in moderation. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Does an alcoholic just have a little alcohol in moderation and it's cool? Right. What, what about a drug addict? Is it okay for him to have a little Coke here and there? I mean, if you're an addict, you're an addict. Is that correct? I mean, right. you've been in various recovery programs. Mm -hmm. um, and so talk a little bit about that because, you know, that, that oh, you know, moderation doesn't, I mean, for some, okay, fine. But for a lot of us, no. So you're, we're, there's only the two camps. You're either a moderator or you're an abstainer. If you have to put effort into moderating, you are not a moderator. Even if you succeed in your efforts, <laughs> you are still like, that is not you. Moderators don't have to try. I'm married to a moderator. Me too. He could, he couldn't care less. <laughs> like mine too he forgets to eat or he'll eat once a day or we go to a restaurant he'll order dessert dessert and take two bites and i'm like you're not gonna eat that. <laughs> i feel you <laughs> like, i cannot relate to that at all moderators don't have second thoughts if you like so we so desperately as addicts want to be moderators we want to believe that, that we can be a moderator. And that's why we tend to gravitate towards people who like we follow people on social media and we follow the, in, like we try to embrace these ideas that say you can be a moderator, even though it's never worked for us. If I were capable of moderating, I wouldn't even be sitting here. I would have never been 260 pounds. I would have just moderated. It's, you know, it, it, it comes naturally to moderators. Anybody else, it, you know, we have to try that, that we're just going to keep spinning our wheels, feeling frustrated, staying obsessed, stay, you know, staying enslaved. Um, you know, so once I accepted that I, there were certain things that I could just never have because it 100%, if I have it, it's going to end up in a downward spiral. It's so much easier to not have something. And people get upset at the idea of like, you know, never having birthday cake again, or, you know, like it, like like life isn't worth living without birthday cake like there's so many other great parts of life that now that i'm not obsessed with food 24 7 that i can spend energy on mm -hmm. you know and i enjoy i enjoy vacations more because yes. i'm not like napping my way through you know i'm not <laughs> having carb comas like on my vacation i don't come home 10 pounds heavier i don't like there's so much more of life that's enjoyable because I don't have the obsession with food anymore. Like where everything used to revolve around food. Yes. Everything. If I left the house, there was all, always on my mind, mm. where was I going to eat while I'm out? Yes. Totally, totally relate to that. And yeah, that, that just kills me when people, 
act like you're so deprived. And they use that whole moderate thing. Well, anyone who cuts out a, a you know, certain foods or including sugar um, is just ridiculous because, and they're, especially on TikTok, you have all these little dancey girls. <laughs> this is what I did. You don't have to quit sugar. You don't have to, uh, you know, and carbs, uh, you know, all those kind of stuff. And oh. I'm like, really? really okay how old are you first of all and number two what are you really doing you know right. teaching There's all these a people. lot of people who who have like a uh you know they have like their their online persona and their fitness business or whatever and they're completely disordered with food they look like they have the perfect body yes right but they're screwed up about food. And then, and, and, and then I, I know what you're talking about too. Like there are some people like they have that attitude. I've come across, like I've, you know, people are always like sending me stuff. Did you see this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I, like, like 30 seconds into it. And I'm like, I'm not even going to listen to this. This woman who is spouting about how carbs are not the enemy has never been 260 pounds, has never birthed three kids, has never suffered from ble- like, that whatever she's doing like works for her for that look but I guarantee you she's probably she's very you know very disordered in in other ways when it comes to food and just looking good does not mean you are free or that you know what you're talking about or that you're doing it right or that you're healthy no nope. like, so all of that like yeah that kind of like get you know gets at me when, when uh-huh. talk about you know and then especially like there's certain hashtags that I follow on Instagram, like their eating disorder hashtags. And the majority of them like make me crazy because they do, they talk about how, you know, you shouldn't restrict, you shouldn't cut out whole food groups, but we, there are things in life that we restrict ourselves from doing because we know they're bad, right? Like we don't ever purposely put our hand down on a hot stove. Oh, how's that feel? We don't do that. We never do that because we know we touch it. We're going to get burned. We don't dart out into traffic. We don't like there are, there are, that's, those are kind of extreme examples, but there's lots of things in, in life that we restrict ourselves from doing because they know we know it would be harmful. So if I know eating excessive carbohydrates or putting sugar or grains into my body is harmful to me, why would it be disordered for me to not do that? It's more disordered to continue doing the thing that harms you and, and thinking that somehow it's going to work out okay. Like, it's not. Like, there's nothing wrong with with restricting things that are harmful. Like, I hate that that is put out there like it's a bad word, restriction. No, you know what, restriction saved my life. And I don't feel restricted. I don't feel deprived. It's so much easier not to have something than to try to control my portion of it. Absolutely, and you wanna know what real restriction is? It's being on medications. It's having to go to doctors because you're so sick. Missing out on your kid's life because you, feel too horrible about yourself or you're so unhealthy, you can't go and do things that are fun that yeah. a normal person would be able to do. Yeah. That's restriction. Living Looking at the mirror. The sidelines is yes, yes. And and preferring to be a bug on the wall. You want to be there, but you don't want to be seen. There yeah. that is restricting. Yeah. Looking in the mirror and hating the person you see, that's restricting. Yeah. I'm sorry. Cutting out yeah. something that, like you said, is harmful is not restricting. It's yeah. freeing. It's yeah. liberating. And yeah. if you haven't experienced that, then you don't know. Then right. you must not be in the same camp, you know? Right. So, and I get that the, most of the, you know, the influencers out there, people that post this stuff, they have good intentions. They're trying yes. to help people. Mm-hmm. But it's not helpful to tell someone who has tried moderating a million times that all they have to do is eat in moderation. That is not helpful. That is infuriating. Like, Mm. do you think I didn't try that already? (laughs) Like my husband used to tell me all the time, it's real simple. Just eat less and exercise. Like seriously, like, do you, why didn't I think of that? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, it's that easy. Oh, really dang. What? Yeah. Why did I not ever do that? Huh? Yeah, yeah. But there are, I mean, but people that don't have the disorder, they cannot relate. They think, right. you know, they do. They, they think it's crazy. Right. And somebody who can easily eat one cupcake and walk away doesn't understand the person who wants to eat 12 cupcakes. 
They can't. And that's why someone like that should not, I mean, I just firmly believe like people that have not personally recovered from the ravages of an eating disorder should not be advising somebody on how to recover from an eating disorder. If you cannot relate, if you've never experienced that and you think it's helpful to tell someone, all you got to do is eat in moderation. What, you know, that is, it's, it's so hurtful. It's actually hurtful, you know, and it's just yeah. maddening to, to, to see that. Like, it, it's, it's just not like so many times over my life, I've, I've been given that, inf- you know, advice from doctors and, and therapists and, you know, women's magazine, like, you know, we were, we're always like seeking the answer. Right. And I always would try to do it that way. But also, and I, you know, you, you only have willpower for so willpower only goes so far. Like mm. I could white knuckle it and I could have 1200 calories a day and still work in my, you know, like I can remember, like I was, I, I was like the queen of calorie counting for many, many, many years. Like that was my thing. It was, and I would, I learned how to work a Snickers bar. Like I'm like, Ooh, I have 300 calories left for the day. A Snickers is 280. Bam. There we go. Yep. I have a Snickers. But the problem is once you have the Snickers, the cravings are turned on, your brain lights up, you are, you feel physically compelled to eat more. And so that was like always the beginning of the end for me. I can remember like trying Atkins a couple of times and like discovering that a six piece McNuggets had like 13 net carbs or something. Right. So like, I'm like, Oh, okay. I'm going to go get McNuggets. And the McNuggets were the beginning of the end every time like yep. once it's introduced the cravings start raging and for some people it's a slow fade like okay i'm gonna have a one a cheat meal once a month and that works for two months and then the next month oh it's every other week and then the next <laughs> month a cheat meal every week and then the, the month after that we're just right back to just eating the wrong thing all the time and then yep. for others and it depends on i guess the year but for others like that first bite that's it the next day it's on 500 carbs. Mm -hmm. There are many like that. Yeah. You know what the other thing is that, that really disturbs me too, is when people put out that, you know, moderation uh, message. And then you look at the comments. I always like to look at the comments and people are like, yeah, girl or guy, whatever. Yes. That's what it's about. You should blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and you know, they're talking sugar in this. It's not going to hurt you to have a little bit of sugar and all this. And I'm just like, Oh my God, you're just looking for somebody to tell you it's okay. When you no, it's not because you are that person who can't stop, but yeah. yet you're looking for validation that what you're doing is the right way and that, you know, people like us are nuts. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's why I look, you know, I look at some like Instagram accounts and every single post is food and a lot of like replacement junk foods. And you see, yeah. they have like 200,000 followers because yeah. that is, People are so obsessed with food and they want to know what can I eat? What can I get away with? And, you know, so when someone comes along and is like, yeah, eat whatever you want, just eat in moderation, people respond to that because that's what they're looking for. They're looking yeah. for to give them permission to eat the crap, even though yes. eating the crap has never served them well, right? It doesn't serve us to, to do that. So those of us that have the unpopular message of abstinence and, mm-hmm. you know, no cheating, nobody wants to follow that. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, it's not it's, fun. <laughs> like I'll, con- I constantly get asked to like people DM me and they're like, well, what sweeteners do you like? What sweeteners do you use? What's recommend? And I, and I'm like, okay, well, you're not going to like my answer, but I don't really do sweeteners. Like <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't really advocate for sweeteners because for me, it turns my cravings on. It can. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So as long as we're talking about things that trigger, and this is kind of part of the question I was going to ask you earlier, and we were talking, you know, before we hit record and uh, about body positivity. Okay. Let me just put a little disclaimer here and I can probably speak for both of us. We are not shaming people. We, We do not believe that you shouldn't love your body. We're not saying that's a bad thing, but there are some issues with that. And take it, Mary. <laughs> yeah. So I have mixed emotions about the whole, you know, hashtag body positivity, right? I do. I definitely think that we should work on loving ourselves. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that we shouldn't talk badly about ourselves. Like I do, like we were talking, you asked earlier, like what do I see when I look in the mirror? I, I do work hard on like, I have kind of this rule that if, if I catch myself saying something negative that I have to, in, then I also have to say something positive. So if I like catch myself complaining about my stomach, then I'm like, oh, okay, but look, but you have great, you know, you have great muscle tone in your legs. Like, you know, so I try to like counter that, right? I think it's important that we love ourselves where we're at and that we don't berate ourselves and pick, you know, don't pick apart our bodies. But I also think that we should not be doing that to our detriment. We should not embrace being 400 pounds in the name of body positivity. They're ultimately being, and I know there's a big debate about like weight doesn't equal health, but in a lot of cases it does. Someone who's 400 pounds, even if they have not been diagnosed, definitely has something going on. I think mm -hmm. that that should be like a no brainer that even if you, because a lot of people walk around undiagnosed with type two yes. diabetes, but I guarantee you that there are people that are type two diabetic that think that they're fine because no one's ever diagnosed them. So I don't think that, you know, and it's definitely, it's not fat shaming it. And I hate when people like interpret it that way. It's not yeah. fat shaming to say that we should not embrace happily being 400 pounds in the name of body positivity. Yes. You should love yourself enough to do something for your health and, and for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's not about, looking good. Does it feel good to look good? Yes. Does it feel good to, to dress up and feel confident? Yes. But the priority should be health. You know, I think when we, you know, when we focus, there's a saying that when you focus on, um, when you focus on the weight, you, you can't recover. When you focus on recovery, the weight will loss will come, right? Like if you, if you focus on getting healthy, it's going to, you know, manifest in some, some weight loss, you know, and I just, I, I it, it bothers me when I, you know, pe see people like accept, you know, cause that's the voice of sabotage girl, just accept it. You're big. You're not meant to be thin, you know, embrace your, your, your big body. Sure. But you know, you, you gotta want to, to be healthy because ultimately being obese for a lifetime, I mean, I, I was obese for 20 ish years. It was, did not feel good. I tried to accept myself. Like every time I, I came to the voice of sabotage, when the voice of sabotage said, just quit all this dieting nonsense, just eat what you want and be happy. You know what happens every time I fell for that? was my eating disorder progressed. Cause what do, what do you do when you eat, eat what you want and be happy? Well, the binges just continued. I didn't magically become a moderator because I, you know, tried to accept I was a big girl. Like it doesn't work that way. No. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think body positivity is important, but I also think that in the, under that umbrella of body of loving yourself, that we should take care, we should take care you know, take care of our body. We should do things that are, are good for us. Absolutely. And the mental is so, so, so important. And the emotional is too. So yes, you should not hate your body and abuse it and think of it as an enemy, which I did. Yeah, you can't um, hate yourself to hell. No, no, you absolutely cannot. But at the same time, what you're not understanding is... <laughs> I mean, I don't care what anybody says. I do not care what they say. When you, like you said, when you're 400 pounds, you are uncomfortable and there's some issue going on there that needs to be addressed and you're missing out on quality of life. Yes, absolutely. You know, so it's, it's so much about health. It's, you know, get healthy to lose weight, not lose weight to get healthy. Right. I'm not saying you can't drop some things by losing weight. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, you can get your, you know, A1C lowered. There's some things that happen when you lose weight. Yes. But there's a difference when you're on the other side and you actually experience true health. Right. That is the best. That well, is free. Mental health is a huge component. Like we don't get mm -hmm. 400 pounds or, or in my case, I was 260. I didn't get 260 pounds because I was mentally healthy. Like exactly. there was disorder there. Like, 
So, I mean, at the very least, even if you haven't been diagnosed with actual health issues, there's something going on. We don't become 263, 64, 60 because we're normal with food. Mm -hmm. There's an abuse of food going on there. And there's, a re there's multiple reasons for it. If we never address those, we're never going to feel true freedom or true joy or happiness. I don't care what anybody says. You're what you said about being 400 pounds or even 260 pounds. Like I was, I was extremely uncomfortable, <laughs> extremely uncomfortable all the time in my skin around other people sitting in chairs, getting up and down. God forbid I had to get on the floor for something and, and get up like tying my shoes. I would lose my breath trying to tie my shoes to the point where I stopped wearing tie shoes and I just wore flip-flops all the time because I could step into them. <laughs> like you, you, you learn to, I, I think part of like they're, they're, we learn to adapt, like we easily mm -hmm. adapt to things, even things that are bad for us. And so you, I adapted to being fat and I did things like, you know, in a way that I didn't have to expend very much energy you know, like wearing, wearing flip-flops all the time because tying my shoes took way too much effort and I would like lose my breath. Um, you know, so we accept these things and, and then like, the, and flying on the plane, like flying on a plane was so oh. uncomfortable. At the end of every flight, I would get off and my feet and my ankles would be the same size as my thighs, like oh. swollen, retaining water. Like, it, it's very uncomfortable to be obese. So even if you, you know, want to put that image out there, well, oh, body positivity, you are not feeling good. You're not. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Coming from being an obese, obese person. I mean, you know, even if I embraced, you know, love my body, etc., I would still be uncomfortable. I still would not enjoy wearing my clothes because it doesn't feel good. Everything's tight and pinching yep. and, you know, you can't find anything that fits right. It's, it's miserable. The yep. shopping, like you mentioned before, miserable. So yeah, no, love your, love yourself. Yes. Care enough about yourself to, to get yourself healthy because that's where it's at. You want to be there for your kids, your grandkids, great grandkids even, right. you know, and like I have a little grandbaby waiting for me right now, you know, <laughs> so that's why I keep her during the day. So, you know, I, I ought to be healthy. I can't be, you know, not being able to put on my shoes because I'm out of breath. You know, I, I, I don't have time for that. So that's where it's at is true health over yeah. aesthetics anyway. Yeah. Quality so, of life. Absolutely. Okay, let me check the time. Okay. All right. We, oh gosh, I could just talk to you forever. Um, okay. So tell us before we go a little bit about what you do, what your coaching involves and what a client can expect from you. So I, I can call myself a ketogenic lifestyle coach. Um, I work one-on-one -on -one with people, but our, my most popular coaching is um, along with my friend, uh, Jessica Reynolds, Coach Jessica. We have a very popular food addiction and recovery uh, group that we do. It's an eight week long group and it, we cover the steps to food sobriety and then applying them to all the areas in our life. And we, you know, we cover things like ha ha dealing with social situations, dealing with naysayers and um, relatives and friends and family who don't understand um, what, you know, dealing with um, recognizing where, what, what is in our circle of influence, how, how our journey changes relationships. Like we cover so much stuff in, in this eight week group. And, and that is like the core of what I do is help people with the um, emotional side of it. Cause I mean, anybody could like, okay, here's some macros, here's a food list. And here's what you should eat. Like you don't need a, I don't think people need a coach for those things. Like people need a, a coach and, and, a, and guidance to discover, like get to the, the root of like, why, why do I use food improperly? Um, why do I binge eat? Why am I obsessed with the, the scale, you know, like, you know, overcoming numbers, obsession, all that stuff. Like that's how people get free. It's not just, you know, here's, a, here's a food list and just do this and you'll be fine, right? Like there's so much more involved. Um, and so that's what I work with people on, one-on-one -on -one and in, in the, the group setting, like addressing those issues and, and providing the tools to get through those types of situations. Awesome. Okay, one last thing. Do you have any advice for those out there 
who are struggling, maybe with self-esteem, maybe with weight, maybe with having really large boobs. I mean, is there anything that you can kind of generalize and give some advice to those people? So, I mean, my main thing is, you know, love yourself where you're at, recognize, okay, I have, there's the, here's these issues that I, that I want to tackle. Recognize that we can really only, you know, chase one rabbit at a time. If your biggest issue is you, you can't stay on plan that you keep gravitating towards carbs, then you're focused, forget about everything else and focus just on eating, eating the right things. Don't even worry about whether or not you eat too much. Um, if you're, if you are already like, you know, uh, eating the right things, but you're still binging, then focus on why are you still binging? You know, look for root causes and look to deal to to deal with those things. Um, I think it's really important to to recognize that it's not just about the food. That if you really want lasting change and, and finding freedom, that you got to look deeper than the surface of, of what you eat. You've got to look at like why you have done what you've done, why you are at the point that you're at. Love it. Perfect. Okay, y'all. While you're here, subscribe and follow Mary. And I'm going to have all her stuff below. Don't worry. But if you're struggling with all these things, the self-esteem, the emotional issues, eating disorders, any of that kind of thing, get help. Go see Mary. Check her out. She's awesome. And if you watch this whole thing, you know she's awesome. So don't be afraid to ask for help. It's okay. That's Thank right. you so, so, so much for being on, Mary. I've, I've had a blast. I enjoyed it. <laughs>